Welcome, everyone. It's really my great pleasure to introduce Brian Seeley this evening to continue the semester series of public events and discussions dedicated to fundamentally resituating the issues of race, racial and social equity, anti-Black racism, and other forms of systemic racism, othering, and oppression as urgently central to all of the disciplines of the built environment, their teaching, and their practice. In a recent interview with Martin Peterson for Common Edge, Lee, answering the question of what was different about this moment, stated the following, a substantial number of medical doctors and nurses are now defining racism as a public health crisis. That's a shift. And I think when we're talking about this moment, we have to consider not just the murder of black people by way of acute police force, but by way of in ingrained systems that have for so long primed us to be the first harmed. Reflecting on why this moment might be different from past moments, Charles Davis, an assistant professor of architectural history and criticism at the University of Buffalo and co-editor of the book, Race and Modern Architecture, suggested during last Friday's discussion, another way in which we might be living, quote, combinatorial consideration, as Lee suggested, that it is a convergence of the, moment, the momentum and intensity of new forms of engaged and activist practices happening in concert with decades of historical and critical scholarship that have combined to create some of the most exciting, powerful, and meaningful modes of being and acting. As architects, planners, urban thinkers, and actors in the world today, this reading renders our time a hopeful moment of inflection. This hopeful and hopefully decisive and transformative turning of the corner for our disciplines and practices is one that Lee has tirelessly worked towards and indeed led in many ways. With an unwavering commitment to an architecture and planning practice that supports and advances social, racial, and environmental justice in the built environment, Lee's practice, Collocate Design, has uniquely and consistently re-entangled architecture and planning, building and city, individual and collective action, process and product, design and advocacy, aesthetics and ethics to serve and empower communities in the co-production of spaces of racial, social, and cultural equity. As we think of architecture and design as enabling forms of practice that draw together so many different ingredients and actors, what we choose to erase and what we choose to reveal, what and whom we choose to serve, what we engage in, and what, where, and how we draw our lines, these are the kinds of questions that Lee's positions and multifaceted form of practice urge us to consider. Lee earned his Bachelor of Science in Architecture from Ohio State University and a Master of Architecture from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He received a 2013 AI Diversity Recognition Award, was a 2015 Next City Vanguard Fellow, and has a decade of experience in the field of architecture. He is the founding organizer of the Design Justice Platform and organized the Design as Protest National Day of Action, which has grown into the Design as Protest Collective. He has led two award-winning architecture and design programs for high school students through the Arts Council of New Orleans and the National Organization of Minority Architects. In 2017, Lee was named one of the Fast Company Most Creative People, and in 2019, Colocate won the Architectures, Architecture League's Emerging Voices Award. The re response this evening will be given by Lee Altman, Adjunct Assistant Professor of Architecture in Columbia's GSAP's Urban Design Program, where she coordinates the program's regional design studio in the Hudson Valley. Lee is not only an, inspire pract an inspiring practitioner and educator, but also an inspiring speaker. And I'm really delighted to have him with us this evening. Please welcome Brian Lee. Dean, that was impressive. I'm not sure how to respond to that, but thank you again so much um for having me this this evening uh thanks to columbia writ large uh gsap thank you lee for uh joining us as well uh tonight and yeah thank you all for coming in and and giving us your 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 attention on this so uh, i'm gonna kind of power through what um 
what is a pretty substantial arc of uh, design justice as a practice, both from a historical and theory uh, uh, standpoint, and what that looks like uh, as we move uh, from theory into into practice. So obviously, the practice component of of this work. Um, but again, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say that, you know, thinking about uh, all of the work that's happening in this moment, uh, it is necessary for us to take these particular moments to take a step back and think about the kind of interconnected um, uh, spaces and places that we are, are uh, working within and working to design um, uh, over time. So all of these spaces are the ones that, that we can start to challenge uh, through the work of design justice. So as we get started, I, I want to start with the, the notion that um, power and place as a, as a concept are historically uh, uh, entangled beyond, um, uh, beyond the kind of singular moments that uh, we currently uh, understand. And, and ultimately, we'll start to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Co-locate was formed out of that notion that uh, power is inherently uh, entangled with it. And so we talk specifically about the uh, sophisticatedly informal use of formal language or familiar conversation attached to place. Uh, so colloquial and locate. Uh, our, our firm was rooted uh, in that notion that there is a sophisticated language of people and place that uh, resonates in, in, in particular uh, areas for a particular frequency. And if we can tap into that, we can actually build better spaces and places that align uh, with our feelings and emotions and, re and relationships of culture uh, to those spaces. So in that, we think about the, the word co-locate itself when we talk about the sequence of words and phrases that are habitually juxtaposed with another at a frequency greater than chance. And this, to me, was such a beautiful uh, uh, definition that we, we carried that one step further and started to think about the sequence of people and place habitually juxtaposed with one another at a greater frequency than chance. So uh, the a a aspects uh, of design justice that start to seek out the moments where uh, particular interactions with space are repeated over and over and over and reproduced to a point in which uh, privilege or, or harm uh, certain communities. And the places and spaces where we can identify those uh, allow us to, again, think about and build at a bigger, better pace. So the premise, the total premise of design justice starts with two kind of uh, primal concepts, right? So our collective values are validated through the spaces and places we design. So this core concept that what we believe gets vested into the spaces that we design. That's a very simple task, but oftentimes we negate uh, to think about architecture as a relationship or a conversation. Uh, we see it as a monologue um, uh, in society rather than a, than a dialogue. And so, I reference the Cornell West quote uh, very often that talks about justice is what love looks like in, in public. And we tag that on to the other end of it and talks about design justice is what love looks like in public spaces. It is a deeper expression of our relationship and our beloved uh, towards our beloved communities expressed in physical form. It is a relationship. Um, and oftentimes we, we don't see that. I often talk about design and, and, and architecture as uh, we found this, this small little crevice that says architecture is too big uh, to solve the intricate complex small stuff and it's too small to address the big uh, overarching considerations and uh, we've allowed ourselves to be complicit by finding this neutral zone that uh, says that we don't have to do anything on either side of it. we don't have to deal with the small and complex we don't have to challenge the systems above us and uh, my kind of general statement, our general statement around design justice is that uh, that is bull. Uh, our job is inherently to attack those systems in some fat form or fashion um, to build and envision a better uh, world. And what is architecture if not the ability to envision a space, a place um, uh, that is better than the day it was uh, the day before. And so with that notion, we, we, we often talk about the fact that for nearly every injustice there is in this world, there is an architecture, a plan, a design that sustains it. 
So when we talk about the largest issues we face in society, whether it's climate change, 39% of carbon emissions and 40% of energy use is uh, through the physical environment. Um, the issues that we see economically are often rooted in housing, transportation, uh, and the remnants of redlining covenants. We all have seen this. We've all read uh, bits and pieces of that. Uh, we think about the kind of unjust policing policies that uh, permeate um, uh, our, our history, but specifically codify this this particular moment. Um, they're they're rooted in in the control and power of place and space. Malcolm X once said, um, uh, "The history of all all uh, all revolutions is based in a war between the landless and the landlord." Um, and again, our pursuit of independence of freedom uh, is one that must challenge and, and we must be forced to bleed to metaphorically uh, give ourselves uh, in our work and, and, and in our lives to challenging that, that, um, that relationship, the landless versus the landlord. Now, as I mentioned, design justice is a way for us to radically vision a racial, social, and cultural reparation through the process and outcomes of design. And now, it is extremely important to recognize that the processes of, of design are equally as important to the outcomes here in this, in this particular frame of, of working, in large part because those who have been harmed by the processes that have existed before uh, we come into a particular uh, moment um, have to deal with the residual impacts. And if we are not careful, if we are not um, able to, to relate to those moments, we are uh, losing the opportunity to rectify some of the harms that have been done uh, in the past. And so process becomes absolutely necessary to achieve the outcomes uh, that we seek. And then additionally, design justice calls on us, calls on us to, to challenge the privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a means to perpetuate uh, injustice and oppression throughout the built environment. Uh, the tools that we use are often uh, centered in, in power and power uh, from the beginning of this country and before uh, has always been rooted in land. And so how we mine that land, how we, how we use that land and cultivate that land, um, whether we build on it, and how we uh, seek the outputs and the, 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 the uh, reap the rewards uh, of that land. And so we have to challenge the system that use land to, to further uh, power grabs and to further uh, their own uh, interests. And so we set our work in these kind of core principles. That means that we have to honor the griot. Uh, that means that we amplify the voice of those in the extant community uh, that have established a, a history uh, that will far exceed any uh, supplementary research process or process uh, projects that we might do within a community. We can uh, sit there for months, uh, weeks, uh, weeks or months on end, but the person who, uh, who we call the Miss Marys on the block, the people who have lived in a particular community for years and years and years and understand where the crack in 1968 happened on the sidewalk on Smith Street. They understand precisely how uh, a neighborhood functions because they've been there for so long and they can understand its, its, its uh, nuances in a way. Um, design justice requires us to build power in place. So we're not uh, necessarily or singularly um, in a space to to just build a building. We are always there to build community. We are always there to build power in community. Um, design as a as a form is a is the process of transition or manifesting power uh, unto itself. And so, how might we utilize the 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 length and time of process to build community and transfer power uh, into communities' hands uh, as much and as often as possible? Um, recognize, John Justice calls on us to recognize uh, that culture is both evolution and culture is revolution. Uh, it is slow paced and it is immediate. Uh, it asks us to, uh, again, lift the stories of people who have uh, been in space over time, but also to lift the stories of those who are actively calling out the harms that are being done in the present. Uh, it also calls us to imagine a just future as I mentioned before, it calls on us to think about uh, how form follows fiction in specifically in communities that have been disinherited over time. Uh, this, is, this is one of the ones that, that we all know uh, fairly well, the form follows function as a, as a, as a trope. Uh, but the idea that um, 
the form of space and place follows the fiction specifically for those who have never had the opportunity or have been disenfranchised from the opportunity to shape uh, their environments. Um, we, are, we are given then the opportunity to shape uh, our environments through stories, through narratives, um, and, 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 and thusly we must understand that whatever buildings, whatever spaces we start to design moving forward, respond to the story, not simply uh, the current condition. Um, we must seek to repair and liberate uh, through this work. We must commit to being a radical in this work. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. And then lastly, we must commit to using design as a tool uh, for protest. Because again, we are seeking to change uh, the space and place uh, that we are, uh, spaces and places that we are operating uh, within. Design calls on us again, uh, uh, it, has, it is, to work with an unyielding faith in the power of a just society. We always talk about protest as an unyielding faith in the power and potential of a just society and design at its best acts uh, as such. Um, and so through that process of design, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of unpack some of these as we move forward. Uh, we ask people to think about these just simple demands that start to get activated through the work we just talked about or through the processes we just talked about. How might we start to divest from and reallocate police funding, uh, put that towards um, supporting communities that have historically been uh, 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 dismantled uh, through the use of power? Uh, how do we end um, prisons, uh, sorry, the design of prisons and police stations that support those oppressive states? How do we reflect uh, a spatial injustice in the training and licensing of, of uh, designers and architects? How do we uh, think about ending septed tactics or enhancing self-determination in communities? How do we reimagine the financial models that support uh, how design is brought to bear in our communities? Um, what's more, how, how might we think about shifting public policies to allow for uh, just design. See, we are a part of a larger system that reproduces outcomes regardless of whether or not we attempt to have um, uh, a, a just design practice. And so we have to be diligent about how we are constantly challenged public challenging and shifting public policy so that it makes it removes one more barrier from us being able to do our work and others being able to do their work towards justice how might we preserve and invest in cultural spaces specifically culturally uh, black and brown spaces across this country how might we then think about redefining the metrics for what it means to live in neighborhoods all of these things uh, call on us to rethink uh, our processes and then ultimately calls on us to rethink um, the typology and the program the, the program that we use to, to create spaces moving forward. Um, so those demands, as we talked about, uh, as the Dean mentioned a little earlier, were a part of a push for the DAP Collective, which asked people to sign on to uh, considering these as a part of their practice. And so uh, just as a brief pause and understanding that there are uh, so many more people doing this work than uh, just myself and our practice. Um, there have been over uh, 3,000 plus letters signed and sent. There are 2,000 plus commitment, or sorry, 200 plus commitments, 42 firms, 53 university representatives, a one a large uh, uh, industry organization signed on. Um, then I'll pass through just a few of these just so that you get a chance to see, uh, again, more than just uh, co-locate doing this work. So to unpack that, right, how might we start to address all of these issues that, again, feel larger than we are generally capable of addressing through a building, right? We often, I often get the, the quote, well, you know, uh, architecture doesn't really deal with policy. Um, that's in the realm of someone else, right? And, and that's because we don't necessarily unpack and understand uh, the continuum of, of power. And so, uh, so we talk through what that continuum looks like in order for us to get to a design that challenges power, you have to know what power looks like. And so we break this down into the signal and the receiver. And the signal and the receiver uh, really are simply these points that are, are sending signals back and forth. The signal, pedagogy, policies, procedures, uh, the receiver practice projects and people. Um, and if we understand what they're attempting to do through each of these 
uh, mechanics or these components, we can then start to, to address. These are all the components or these are some of the components in which design can directly impact and ultimately we can impact, we can impact the larger, or so we can address the larger issues that we're dealing with in the physical environment. So pedagogy, again, how are we changing how we think about this world? What's the ideology that we are left or we, we bring to the table uh, as we move into uh, our work? Um, what are the policies that then get codified by way of that ideology? What we believe, again, what we value is often validated through the spaces and places we design. So what we believe through pedagogy often gets uh, tagged into our policies. There is a there is then a difference between policy and procedure. Um, Procedure is the implementation strategy, while uh, again, policy is the ideal uh, codification. This is how it should go. This is what we want to do to make that happen. Uh, and then on the other side of that, uh, practice, projects, and people, we are all receiving this input. Uh, and we're saying, well, I'm gonna follow that input or I'm not going to follow that input. Uh, and so I try to bring uh, attention to, to one clear point here. When we talk about policies and procedures, we often look to uh, a simple one that everyone uh, really knows, uh, which is, is redlining. And so redlining uh, from a policy standpoint didn't precisely call out uh, black people uh, from, from being excluded uh, within, uh, within the built environment. What it called uh, black people and others uh, within uh, that, that, that the system felt needed to be disenfranchised, uh, undesirables. So it called us undesirables. Now the procedure then called out black people or brown people in that process, uh, but the policy itself was a different thing. And so recognizing the difference between, as a design team, are we addressing policies? Are we addressing procedures? Uh, are we addressing internal practices that we have? Uh, or are we addressing a project standard set that needs to be shifted in order to do justice to it for and with a community? Uh, and so that requires us to extend our timeline and a practice up and down a scope that moves beyond the standard scope of services uh, for a design firm. So I asked earlier that you become an, uh, a radical, right? So that you think about what radical uh, is and, and what it means to be a radical in this work. And really fundamentally, this is just asking us to get to the root uh, of a meaning, right? Root of, of, of a cause. And so if we as designers, uh, as those who start to seek out problems in order to address them, can't get to the root, then we are doing a disservice to uh, not just our clients, but the broader world uh, as we start to do this work. So the language we use in this work is always important. And I often ask people what we are afraid of especially when it comes to racialized systems of power. Um, how, are we, how are we moving past our fear? Often the fear is very simple. People don't wanna be called a racist. No one cares. You are racist. You are in a system and you are serving a system that, it, that exists to racialize its, its power to the benefit of the system itself. And so our job then is to figure out how we become anti-racist. Our obligation uh, to each other is uh, to actively acknowledge how these racialized and socialized biases in a system uh, exist and then seek to challenge and dismantle the privilege and power that uses that system. So your job is to seek that anti-racist lens um, or you will stay within that, that frame of supporting and reproducing um, the outcomes of a white supremacist or an oppressive uh, system. It's very simple. We've seen these before. We understand that the isms are distinct and they are, they are systems themselves and the is are really just the operants or the operators of that system. And so when we talk about racism, uh, we are talking about systemic racism. We are not necessarily uh, excluding uh, bias and prejudice at the individual level, uh, but the expectation specifically through the systems of design uh, is, is really for us to address racism from a systems level. Um, and so that means that we have to understand what it means to, to, to dismantle and unpack. What does it mean for us to, to seek out liberation through our work? Um, it means that we have to understand what injustice actually is. It is a unbalanced 
an imbalanced system that uh, denies equal distribution to access and resources uh, throughout a system to maintain, often to maintain uh, power. And so as we move down that, that, that spectrum, and oftentimes uh, after you see something like uh, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery, um, you start to understand that our responses have been woefully uh, inadequate from the academic level, from the professional level, uh, from the policy level, uh, especially as it relates to, um, uh, to how, we, how we build out neighborhoods and communities uh, that protect one another. Um, so when we talk about equality, equality only requires us to make fair or to stabilize in the moment um, and to affirm a standard of fairness moving forward. It doesn't require us to do anything moving forward, but when we say equality, it assumes that a fairness can be achieved in a moment where we ignore all of the past uh, injustices that have been uh, relied upon upon people. So when we think about equality, we move past that and we move into equity. And equity is an acknowledgement of past uh, inequities uh, and to make fair in the present and then to affirm a standard of fairness in the future. It doesn't necessarily require an action, but it requires an acknowledgement in order to move forward. You move forward with knowledge. And justice then requires us to repair for that past injustice, to make fair in the present, and then to remove any barriers to progress moving forward. And then lastly, liberation. And this is the difficult one. People often struggle to get past uh, the first set and move into liberation, or I'm sorry, get to justice. And, and liberation is one step further. That means that we have to repair for our past of injustices to make fair in the present, to remove barriers to progress, and then ultimately affirm, uh, affirmatively influence future outcomes. And this is where people get a little bit uh, tricky is that no one wants to, to uh, essentially cede power. And so as we talk about what institutions can do, uh, there is a power dynamic that has to start to be broken up and redistributed. And uh, affirmed uh, for those who have been historically disconnected from uh, power over time. And so uh, in order for us to understand that, how it's placed into, uh, into the built environment, we have to understand kind of a critical path of history. And I'll go through a couple of these real quick and then show you what that looks like uh, in a physical environment. Now, uh, quickly, again, uh, we, we do a, a, a very short timeline, but we're talking about uh, black codes, which uh, established, again, continued control over the physical environment, uh, where and how black people could exist within uh, physical spaces. And the slave codes that you saw in 1865 are often the same vagrancy uh, codes that you see in current muni codes across the country. They've been edited slightly to... to, to uh, contemporize the, the the language, but often they are asking and calling on the same set of things around vaguely around trespassing, um, around loitering, uh, quote unquote, uh, and all of that was rooted in in uh, a lot of what we saw in the Black Codes in, in the early 1800s or sorry the 1860s. Um, we saw Plessy versus Ferguson to uphold segregation. We saw Bauhaus and, and, and modernism really seek to extract the kind of cultural identification of, of cultural communities uh, through identifying uh, a very precise uh, type of architecture uh, over time. We saw in 1921, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court case in 1926, Euclid versus Ambler, which started to uh, to make sure that police power was imbued into zoning, um, at, to single uh, single use zoning. Um, 1937, we saw the Federal Housing Authority start to build out again the subsidies and insurances for particular communities, and that being the baseline, the foundation for so much of the injustice we see today in terms of economic well-being and economic power. Um, 1947, we saw Levittown uh, expand. 41, we saw the project houses uh, pop up in New Orleans and across the country. Um, we saw, after that in 49, we saw uh, slum clearances. And we saw that multiple times over time. We saw it again in the 80s. Uh, 56, we saw Federal Highways Act with often uh, cut through black and brown neighborhoods. In 65, uh, we saw the modern housing policies, uh, affordable uh, and, and the kind of start to, to mortgage crises. And in the late 60s and early 70s, we saw this practice around SEPTED, which sought to uh, really um, 
take a softer stance on police power within physical space by using some of Jane Jacobs, Jacobs tactics to, to think about natural uh, surveillance and territorial control. Um, and the one thing that was that has continued to be missed over time is that um, natural surveillance only works when you have communities. And we've spent um, decades, uh, nearly a century building spaces that were fundamentally about the extraction of wealth through land and not about building communities. And so when we talk about uh, how we formulate spaces uh, to keep people safe, the way we do that is by building communities that actually care about each other uh, and not setting up spaces in which suspicion can uh, run wild and harm those who are often already uh, harmed by systems. Uh, and then again, in the 80s, we saw uh, uh, HUD's uh, development uh, dollars reduced by nearly 80% from 1980 to 89. So these are just a few moments along the timeline that shape our physical environment and force us to operate and act in particular ways. And so that's the, the kind of meta, the policy side of things, but the, the kind of emotional human scale side of things is very clear. Uh, at least to, to some. Uh, when we talk about not belonging in a space, there is the acute racism that we know to be true. It's visceral, it's pictured, um, and it's pictured throughout time and it looks the same. Today, you can look at the Charlottesville, you can, you can look at, at protests yesterday and see the same version of this person screaming, you do not belong here. But the same thing is being said through, uh, through the buildings and spaces. I often tell you to tell the story about the fact that there was there was a, a, a gentleman, uh, a woman, a, a person, an artist who uh, who decided to make a sign, um, and and to make that sign uh, as an artist and and curve the letters and put the neon and hang the sign and and that person looked to their significant other and their, their children and said, look, I did something great, I made something. Um, but they made something that was complicit in a system. And so as we start to think about how we are complicit in systems, we have to recognize that all of our actions tie back to a larger system and they are all telling uh, those who are marginalized that they do not belong. And so when and where we are reproducing acts that do speak that language, we have to be um, able and capable of challenging it and uh, able to find new ways to address it moving forward. And that's existed throughout time and place, whether it's um, in, in buses or restaurants or in schools or in parks. Um, the notion that uh, it has existed and continues to exist across public spaces and civic spaces uh, requires a knowledge acknowledgement that revolutions happen through the claiming of space. Uh, it happens through challenging the way space can exist and so we see that uh, in present day, uh, we've seen it in our past, um, in occupation uh, of space, a shifting of how uh, space becomes cultural and communal again, um, and requires us to continue to ask these core questions in all of our work. Um, who holds power? What are the power structures that directly impact the communities we are serving? Uh, what are the injustices that directly uh, that are directly a result of that power? Um, who is directly and disproportionately impacted? How does the built environment manifest or perpetuate that in injustice or reproduce it? And then ultimately, what are the opportunities to imagine new systems uh, to agitate, to, to address, uh, to repair uh, by way of design? Now, design is not ever going to solve anything, but literally no individual siloed entity will be able to solve all of these issues. Our job is to play our part and make sure that we are not doing more harm. Uh, because stories, the stories we tell uh, in this are extremely important. And we have to figure out how best to acknowledge those. And we've seen it in the past. We've seen that uh, folks thinking about the, the, what the principles or the foundational principles of design justice uh, might look like, whether it's Tuskegee University, which saw uh, an outgrowth from uh, Robert Taylor and Booker T. Washington, um, many schools that were designed and built uh, with the students and the community surrounding it uh, in mind over that time. We saw W.B. Du Bois talk about the Philadelphia Negro watch uh, and write his, his seminal work that, uh, that really made the connection between the sociological or the socio-spatial uh, conditions of Philadelphia, one of the largest uh, enclaves for um, uh, enslaved people 
uh, after emancipation. Uh, we saw it through uh, the Rosenwald schools, which I'm actually being told res recently we should we should again avoid calling it that because uh, the Rosenwald was was one part of a larger network uh, in which communities uh, of, of color invested so much uh, of their time and energy uh, as, as well as uh, some federal dollars and some philanthropic dollars. But the intention was uh, through this process, through a, a design focused, community focused process, 5,300 schools uh, were built across the South uh, in the early 1900s uh, in order to supplement a problem that, uh, that the larger system uh, was uh, continuing to reproduce. And that was again, segregation in education. Uh, whether it's the museum in DC, which we saw a hundred years. Uh, and this is the other point to make uh, just quickly is that uh, when you're dealing with justice, when you're dealing with a reflection of, of a people over time and what justice might look like in physical space, it often takes uh, that much longer in, in communities of color and for communities of color. Um, 1916 was the origin point for the African American Museum. We saw it actually be erected in 2015, 100 years. And over that time, uh, so many things changed from uh, the uh, insistence upon a memorial uh, and a memorial building all the way uh, through to the existing building as you see uh, today. We saw um, so many people from the AIA uh, in 1968 changed their stance in response to uh, Whitney M. Young. Uh, but um, all of these reports, the Kerner report uh, and, and Whitney M. Young's speech were both reflecting on uh, stipulations from policy, uh, from folks in, in politics and advocacy for so long that said the physical environment was doing harm uh, to communities. And everyone knows the kind of, uh, you have been thunderously silent um, and completely irrelevant. Everyone knows that quote. So we've seen Jane Jacobs. We've talked about uh, Max Bond and the Architectural, Architectural Renew Committee of Harlem. We talked about, um, again, in the past, the Black Panthers and the scope of work in which they sought to vision what new spaces that support community might look like. Uh, we've seen the Claiborne Avenue design team in New Orleans uh, start to, to rethink what it might look like to reclaim a space that was torn uh, torn apart by way of a highway. Uh, we've seen uh, many lo fully love uh, uh, continue to, to speak to this work uh, present day. We've seen Mass Design Group as well. So I want to quickly pivot to the way that we think about this work and the scales that we uh, think about for this work. Um, our work uh, as, as co-locate really starts to address the functional needs of the built environment. And we address those through shelter, health, food, mobility, education, recreation, safety, public, civic space, cultural space, uh, uh, mercantile, and, and transportation. Uh, all of those are the, the kind of frameworks by, by which we work. But uh, fundamentally, it is uh, civic, cultural, and communal spaces are the ones that we address. And we address them through a continuum of design that might be small and ephemeral uh, work all the way to uh, collective and permanent work, but ultimately we are doing whatever work we're doing, we're doing it to address uh, larger systemic issues. And so I'm going to walk you through three projects that uh, talk specifically about um, this work. Um, so the first is, is Blights Out. So Blights Out, uh, after Katrina, we saw um, an increase from around 20, 25,000 vacant properties across the city to about uh, 50,000. Now it's reduced since then, but the uh, the process that the systems uh, in our city operated by uh, would not allow for our city to uh, put these houses or these properties back into use. And so uncovering and thinking about what that looked like needed to be visualized because the scale and scope of that was uh, too much. And so we went through a process of attempting to buy a house and redevelop that house. Uh, in that process, um, I'm sorry, we, we did that so that we can unpack the system uh, as, a, as a coalition of organizations through the Lights Out. Um, for one house, these were all of the, the small things um, at the surface level that needed to be accomplished for that house to be back on the market. And so it became such a, a, a tenuous process that 
uh, it was really impossible to unpack. Uh, and we recognize that nearly uh, every house that had any, uh, any that had been uh, demoed or um, every property uh, in New Orleans that had uh, been sitting for that long had uh, a substantial amount of liens, had a substantial amount of, of debt already accruing on that property. And so no one could really buy the, a property um, without having fifty dollars to $100,000 of debt associated with the property uh, head on. And so uh, this was much more of a design campaign that was meant to occupy small moments and small reliefs uh, within, the, uh, within the city. And so we used uh, a couple uh, campaign strategies. One was a strategy that looked at kind of mayoral and, and presidential uh, election cycles and started to, to work with community members and young people to design uh, a series of yard signs and billboards that spoke to the issues uh, that were specifically uh, addressed in our community meetings. And so uh, we work with the Young, uh, young Design uh, Agency here in, in New Orleans to develop a series of posters that existed across the city. We also use the language of the community to, uh, to actively um, create a moment in which community can address the specific issues of, of vacancy across the city by thinking about uh, second lines. And so we did a lights out second line, which went from city, or I'm sorry, from house to house. Uh, we used uh, musicians and artists to talk about um, the feeling, the emotion, the stories that were bound to those places. Uh, we also uh, uh, talked about the, the stats uh, of those places. Um, we started to bind that to the larger policy initiatives uh, that were preventing us from actually making any headway uh, on these issues. So looking and pointing out the Louisiana constitutional articles that uh, prevented us from uh, recovery at, at its highest level. Now, we ran these uh, when we ran for mayor as a, as a coalition, we ran for mayor in uh, 2017, and every month we were able to, uh, again, reveal a little bit more about how uh, our communities were being disadvantaged by way of uh, this housing crisis. We worked with, again, young people to talk specifically about how trauma is, again, planned into the architecture of our communities and resistance is then uh, developed by way of uh, our response to those traumas. We talked about what the definitions of blight and neighborhood uh, kind of debt look like, what disaster capitalism look like. Again, what those processes look like writ large. The second one was a planning process that was a little larger. Um, and this process was uh, in response to uh, the context that we've seen over uh, more recently over the last six months, but, but more broadly over the last uh, five years. This is um, a project called Paper Monuments, which some of you may know. Um, again, the context uh, in the city of New Orleans, uh, we were attempting to remove um, uh, four racist monuments that have stood in our city for uh, anywhere between 80 and 120 years. And uh, on the backs of, of advocates and activists who have been pushing to remove racist symbology uh, throughout our city for the last 60 some odd years, um, current activists and organizers sought to remove uh, those spaces. And so we saw what it looked like to occupy public space as democratic. See, protest is a democratic uh, condition. Um, and so we sought to ask the question, can we imagine new monuments for New Orleans? Can we start to set up a framework that restores the complexity uh, of our stories and our narratives and, and doesn't just allow for uh, singular white men to hold up uh, and maintain power through the occupation of, of space? What does it look like for us to acknowledge the people, places, events, and movements that shape our city um, and the complexity of our city rather than individuals alone? How do we leverage the systems that currently exist to pinpoint the weaknesses and deficits, but also to pinpoint the assets, the, the kind of humanity uh, that we see across uh, our city. So we talk to people at train stations and uh, we talk to people uh, in the library and at bus stations across the city. We worked with people and had public design days where we uh, 
put up posters uh, in the, the physical environment. We made live and large these, uh, these stories, these narratives that, that have historically been uh, erased uh, through, through, the, the, through time and through history. We use civic infrastructure to tell those stories and cultural institutions uh, to build that out. We talk to young people who are often uh, negated from these stories. And over that time, we collected over 1,500 uh, proposals and talked to thousands more. Um, we occupied and reoccupied uh, public spaces to uh, bring new memories and new stories uh, to these spaces that have been that needed remediation, uh, very much like a brownfield site. These stories of, of uh, these spaces of, of kind of racial terror uh, needed to be remediated through the histories and stories that uh, were present in the communities that lived there. We collected posters and proposals that told a story that was individual and not simply um, uh, labeled as heroic. Um, and we allowed those stories to, to be what they were, whether it was uh, young people or old people or our elders, uh, whether it's people who are thinking about uh, culture or family uh, or just legacy or the, the, the kind of consistency of women throughout the history of, of, of uh, all politics and all uh, uh, city building, but specifically uh, in New Orleans. And then we reflected that back uh, into the world. So as a planning process, what does it mean to, to reflect those narratives and stories back into the world um, of people? We asked authors from across the city, we asked our artists to work with us. Uh, we created um, over 50 uh, posters that told the stories. Uh, and I'd like to tell these, these, these three stories real quick, essentially. Uh, the first one being that, um, you know, the Desire Standoff was, was a, uh, the, the, the anniversary just passed, but it was a Black Panther um, cultural center in the Ninth Ward. And uh, as we were posting up these signs at the scale of, of a monument, um, downtown New Orleans, one of the downtown workers uh, came over and said, I was, I was a young person during this standoff. Now the standoff was uh, at this cultural center, 200 police officers showed up with a tank and, and firearms and tried to blow this building down. Um, like nobody was hurt, no one uh, was murdered that day, uh, but there were young people there and uh, some of those young people got away and got out um, and ultimately, uh, survived. And so those who live to tell that story, um, uh, uh, one of them was a docent. One of them was, was, was essentially a docent for this public art piece who sat there and told the story to anybody who got off the bus, uh, because it, it was not only a story that represented a moment in time, but it rep represented a historical moment for that person and for many others across the city who had to endure uh, that type of police violence, but also uh, that, that uh, kind of cultural trauma uh, ac across the city. The second is Dorothy May Taylor, which we often talk about uh, as helping to desegregate, uh, who did so many more things, but helped to desegregate Mardi Gras uh, in the mid nineties. Now, I know that that probably sounds weird to you, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what happened. And so Dorothy May Taylor, um, we produced these posters and, and these were out uh, publicly, uh, her children, uh, took pictures of these and asked the family whether or not it was uh, viable for them to, you know, if this is something that they appreciated. And, and they did. They wanted to actually use these posters. And so what you saw was the family took pictures and made T-shirts. Now they go to City Hall before the pandemic and they, they perform their civic duty. They show up to council meetings. They show up uh, to, the, to events and, and uh, are representatives in, in a way that uh, makes them prideful of, of, uh, of their mother. And so these things are resonating, again, not just as a, uh, a singular narrative, but a, as a way for us to have collective conversations about the people, places, events, and movements that truly shape who we are as a people. And so, and then lastly, what does it mean for us to then uh, expand that conversation and envision uh, a series of, of uh, monuments that um, 
made real, made manifest from uh, the, the thousands of stories that we were told over that time, whether they are uh, a reflection on the history or the, the history of, of the environment in, in, in Louisiana and New Orleans proper, uh, or potentially our future, whether it's a uh, lighthearted uh, consideration of, of uh, music playing in the city, or whether it is a more solemn uh, consideration of the, uh, the many Africans who were disembarked uh, in New Orleans um, as uh, enslaved people. It all required us to listen, to hear the words and the stories of um, uh, the people who uh, live in this city and to reflect back through the tools that we have uh, as, a, as a planning process. And so that's what you saw over and over again, the reflection of the stories, the narratives uh, that fundamentally uh, have been uh, have been the, the anchor uh, to so many things uh, the, of, of progress, to so many moments of progress throughout this city's history. And then I wanted to lastly uh, show you uh, one project that was speaking to uh, the Claiborne underpass. Now, I've spoken to you about kind of a, 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 an art-based campaign that's one scale. Uh, I've spoken to you about a citywide planning uh, effort. That's another scale. And this is a uh, larger build that is uh, really a, a means to reconnect two halves of a community that uh, are uh, that were sliced apart by way of uh, highways throughout the, the 50s and early 60s. Now, as we mentioned a little earlier, it requires us to make sure that we honor the grief, we honor the stories that people have told over time to understand how uh, we might reflect that back into the work. And so our first step was to ask a question um, about, uh, about Claiborne Avenue. And that question was, what is, what was uh, uh, this place? Uh, it was a it was a place that had it was a bustling black metropolis. It was a bustling black community that had over 400 businesses. Um, nearly all of them uh, were uh, demolished when uh, this highway came through. When I say demolished, almost nearly all of them uh, shuttered uh, when this highway came through. Um, it was a space that had over 400 live oak trees. Uh, that people used as a neutral ground to meet with family, to commune uh, with neighbors, and it was eliminated. Now, marginalized people are always forced to be resilient, are always forced to, to rebound in the face of oppression, and the city has done that. Uh, the people of this city have done that. We utilize under the bridge uh, during Mardi Gras for festivals, for all kinds of things. That does not mean that that trauma uh, does not exist. And so we had to unpack all of those conversations. And in doing so, we started to ask again, what was here, what needs to be here, and how do those stories resonate with you? And we talked to young, uh, our, our, our youth in the city, we talked to our elders uh, in the city, and we started to reflect and build with them. And so we built um, uh, this, this small little pod, uh, that started to show up at festivals um, underneath the Claiborne Corridor. We asked uh, our community uh, leaders uh, about green infrastructure in this city over and over again. We asked our elders to tell us uh, what was here and to, to kind of give us the, the historical framing around this place. We asked our artists to uh, to anchor us in the, the kind of cultural uh, moment. We asked our business people to kind of give us some reality about the, the, the trials and tribulations that uh, they were dealing with. We asked our youth to vision what uh, the spaces are that, that would bring and hold them there in perpetuity. Um, and so those questions uh, became real uh, through uh, the conversations of, of uh, anchoring and creating space underneath this highway. We started with a, a canopy structure that started to uh, envelop and hold um, the, the design of the, the space. We started to make sure that there were levels and layers that were an opportunity to uh, draw on a market space 
um, an outdoor market space. Uh, we wanted to start to make individualized market booths. Now, this is critical because through all of that conversation we had over uh, eight, uh, eight, nine months of, of community organizing, community uh, build out, what we recognized was that um, there wasn't really much of a, a small business uh, space, right? So small businesses, most 90 to 92 percent of, of black and brown businesses in uh, New Orleans existed at with one to three people throughout the entirety of their existence, which means that they didn't have a growth path. They were really just trying to raise enough money to survive, feed their children, uh, go to the next day. And so putting people in a space that uh, they could not afford, that they could not build out, uh, ultimately put them put folks in a position of failure before they were even able to, to be in a space. And so providing a different format for people to grow into a business and giving people the opportunity to, to do that required us to think about space in a different component. And so we went from, um, you know, uh, hard and fast spaces into much more light, uh, light, light gauge uh, 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 spaces. And so those, uh, also bound us to the ability to create more cultural moments uh, throughout the architecture. It meant that when we asked our cultural uh, kind of cultural ambassadors what uh, they really wanted to see, they wanted to see uh, altars, uh, they wanted to see uh, ability to, to honor the dead um, and honor the living, but honor those who have done so much for this place. And so we created and designed spaces that reflect that need those stories to be told, um, for the craftspeople to be engaged, for the art of this place to be recognized and honored, for the young people's stories to be vested in whatever new spaces were built, and again, for our elders to be heard over time. And so in closing, uh, again, uh, really when we think about this, We'd like to, to just really end on this note that language, the language we use in this work uh, is extremely important. Architecture is a language like all languages um, allows us to tell a story because stories ultimately are important. Buildings tell us stories and diverse stories come from diverse cultures because ultimately culture is important. And culture is the consequence, as we mentioned earlier, of persistent circumstance and immediate condition. And our cities, our neighborhoods, our blocks incubate that culture. And so for people of color in America, there is power in the places and spaces where our culture is recognized, where our stories are told, and where our language is valued. Because that is not just good design, that is justice. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brian. That was... Yeah. Um, inspired and thought-provoking as always. Uh, I'm Lee Altman, by the way. Uh, I teach here at GSAP, whatever here means these days. Um, so Brian, I think um, this is a really great opportunity for us to, to kind of build on some of the conversations that took place here on uh, Friday. So there was a book launch for um, Race and Modern Architecture, That's, that was edited by uh, Mabel Wilson, um, Irene Chang, and uh, Charles Davis, and, and really that kind of generated a, a fascinating discussion around the um, uh, role of race in architectural theory and history and, and um, you know, um, urban studies. But I think today we, we have this, um, you know, our responsibility is to talk about this from the perspective of practice. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, where I work and, and many architecture planning urban design practices around the country right now are struggling with this, um, you know, how do we, how do we let go of our fear? How do we um, unlearn the systems and processes that we're working within and unpack them, how do we transform the way that we do our work in order to, to become a just practice or, or, you know, kind of questioning really what that is. What is a just practice of architecture? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we have to move towards, 
when we're when we're trying to to remove ourselves from the, the the fear that that binds us to our current condition, we have to recognize that we are a conduit for power as as designers. We often uh, are not the the initial power source. Uh, doesn't mean we we aren't sometimes, um, but but uh, in order to get to a just practice, uh, we have to recognize what power, what position of power we do have, right? So what gatekeeper are we in this process? Um, and we have spent so much time uh, uh, being insular with our uh, kind of, with our, our practice and, and within academia that we very rarely make the connections back to the larger systems uh, at play. And so I think when we talk about what a just practice looks like, it's one that extends beyond the boundaries of our existing scope, what we believe to be our kind of scope of services, and reaches into uh, the connections of uh, sociology and politics and uh, culture and, and starts to, to be in dialogue and not simply, uh, again, uh, a monologue. I think that's a process for all of us to, to kind of gradually work through. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think is a really interesting model, um, and that's more from the movement side than the practice side, is the idea of um, distributed leadership. Yeah. And that's something that's been really kind of beautiful to follow and see unfold, um, both in, through design justice and, and design as protests, but also through other um, initiatives and efforts that are going on right now from the architecture lobby um, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, um, the Black Matter University or mm -hmm. other uh, kind of collaborations. And still there seems to be either from, from media or from academia or from, from these outside uh, forces, there's always a search for the leader or the spokesperson, if yeah. you will. Um, and I'm wondering, well, A, if, if this is something that you feel is translatable as a model to the practice side of our work. Uh, and B, do you, do you ever feel like you're being put in a position of being a sort of spokesperson for a generation or a movement, whether you like it or not? Ooh, um... Yeah, but but I I, I think that uh, yes, I do feel that qu quite often. But but I think the the key has always been for us. You know, I, for for paper monuments, this was a thing that that happened consistently, where people said, you know, uh, black man likes to talk a, a a lot. We'll you know we'll we'll put the the you know the accolade on him, and we had to essentially have a rote letter that said, you know, it's it's not him, it's not me. It is all of us doing this thing. And, and we would send that to newspaper articles or to, to anybody who would write something that, that would forget the fact that this was a, a coalition uh, of people building towards, a, towards the movement. And so, yeah, it is, it is a bit frustrating, but that is like the natural inclination of, of our society is to start to lionize uh, individuals. And the whole purpose of, uh, of, of, of the movement work we do, but also uh, DAP and DAP from its origins was, was 2000, 2014, um, was that we were decentralizing power. We were actively saying that, uh, A, this work has been done uh, throughout the time in history, and this is not new, uh, but just because we've now given it a name and, and some, 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 some framing, um, we are now able to have conversations about it. I think that was that was critical uh, uh, to, to what this movement starts to look like moving forward. But I think the distributed power framing can work. Uh, it just, the, the struggle we always have to deal with is uh, the, the necessities of capitalism often uh, break that ability uh, to, to maintain distributed power, oftentimes because we're all doing so much additional work that there's, there isn't a real easy way to make sure that uh, compensation is is justly uh, uh, distributed, and so that's that's the thing. The model that we have to to answer for is one that that uh, really seeks to to dismantle our binding relationships to to capitalism and provides us a different 
way to operate and survive. We'll add that to the list. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, paper monuments, actually. Uh, and I think that's obviously something that, that you've been working on for quite some time, but it's in this uh, not a moment, but converges, convergence of momentum and intensity. Is that what you called it? Yeah. Um, I think it's something that's been uh, becoming a bigger part of the discussion, um, really in a lot of other places. And we've seen monuments uh, being taken down around the country and um, maybe not enough, maybe not quickly enough. Uh, some new monuments uh, kind of being installed. There's a, a recently installed um, statue of three suffragists in Central Park that was just yeah. mobbed last time I saw it. Um, but I, I think one of the challenges or, or one of the questions that it raises um, is, for example, with, with the recent passing of uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, it's, it's now a race between our governor and our mayor in New York of who's gonna be the first to um, announce a monument to her in her um, native hometown of Brooklyn. So in, in your work and in your practice, you talk a lot about the importance of process as opposed to product. And I'm wondering to what extent that is, you know, the tool for us to work with in maintaining the, the publicness uh, or the public driven or community driven character of the, the monument practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like the 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 essence of of working from process to outcome requires us to deal with um, issues and considerations that, as designers, we are often uh, neg neglig negligent towards, right? And so when we, when I say negligent, we are negligent towards uh, most communities if it's not a direct extractive relationship, right? So if we're able to, if we're able to pull out data and information from you, great, we'll come, we'll sit down, we'll meet, we'll give you some food and cookies and maybe a few dollars and a, a gift card uh, and, and we'll take your information and we'll go back and do whatever we're gonna do with it. Uh, and it requires then us to, to again, de-emphasize our need to extract and uh, re-emphasize our need to, to listen and hold true um, uh, the, the, the kind of greater um, uh, stories and narratives that exist within a community. And so even for the, the Justice Gin, Gins, Ginsburg uh, kind of memorial or, or, or monument, you know, thinking about all of the other the impacts of the work that that uh, Justice Ginsburg was able to do in the world, all the ramifications and all of the the the, the knock on effects of that work uh, are the things that we want to start to 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 see and talk about. I mean, I think ultimately, uh, if you take a beat and stop just trying to lionize, uh, because what will happen to, to Justice Ginsburg is the same thing that uh, happened to Dr. King, which is to lionize so much so that you forget the humanness of the person. Right? And we, we already started that, right? We already started that over the last you know, few years. We've lionized the woman so much so that we forget uh, her, her humanity uh, to some extent. And, and so I think the process requires us to have larger conversations so that we maintain and retain uh, our humanity, not just our own humanity, but the respect and humanity that we have for others and those who have passed and our elders, uh, it's our, our ancestors now. I mean, I think it's absolutely critical that that's a, that's, that process allows us to frame, uh, frame and maintain our humanity through this. So I think we're, um, we can start taking questions from the audience. And uh, first question from our good friend and colleague, and um, uh, Design Justice Summit fellow, Karen Kuby. Hey. Um, so Karen asks, um, what should we know about funding for your expanded model of practice? If you had your wish, um, who would be paying for this work? Yeah, so I think there's a, a, a couple things. One is that, um, when I talked about HUD losing 80% uh, of its its uh, monies um, 
that that would be equivalent to about 132 billion dollars a year right now. So this is this is the decrease from uh, 80, to, 80 to 89 went from 32 billion dollars down to about six or seven billion dollars, I believe, give or take. Uh, and then just if we were expanding that uh, with inflation, we would we would continue uh, to to see that at about 132 uh, billion dollars uh, today. Now that that. Uh, that much money invested in not just housing, but in communities and cultural spaces, that actually starts to be a framework that allows for cities and states to, to invest in, in real things. That's not determined upon uh, the kind of extractive uh, conditions of developers uh, or, or clients that are, that are not necessarily vested in the totality of the community, but are singularly invested in a property. And so I think one is that we should increase the amount of funds that come from our state, federal, and, and uh, sorry, our local, state, and federal uh, agencies that provide for communities to, uh, to sustain themselves. Um, I think as a, as a second, we should be um, requiring uh, we should be requiring the framing of design justice through uh, all development and thusly removing some of the barriers that developers put on design teams to do that work. So the funding model doesn't mean that we completely extract ourselves from how things currently get built. It means that we eventually probably need to and how that works still needs to be built out. But ultimately, there should be multiple streams that allow us to do the work that serves communities and not simply uh, serves clients. Because ultimately, uh, I can tell you that the, from, from the, the, you know, uh, the many buildings that, that I've worked on in my career, um, you know, especially the ones that were done by developers, almost none of those developers actually lived in those spaces. It was always someone else it was communities it was you know so so we're 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 vesting so much power in people who don't actually care about the the space in place and so we really need to be able to control the outputs from developers who are investing dollars first and foremost and then secondarily i think we need to rethink our funding models from the local state federal uh level around housing um to to invest in communities and neighborhoods at a at a, at a different pace and a different clip I'm sure that resonates with a lot of the folks in our audience. I'm, I'm looking at you, planning students. Um, one thing you just said is that uh, about the developers hardly ever living in their projects, or um, you know that the uh, and and really that shines a light on a on a much bigger problem where we are hardly ever the um, the recipients mm -hmm. of the projects of the work that we do you know at, at any scale from the market stall to the master plan yeah. um and part of the challenge is that um you know we being the the design professionals planning professionals um are not reflective of the American society as it is right now. And I know some of the work that you've done has been uh, focused on trying to change that and starting early, uh, starting at the high school level, working with um, high school students and kids who may not be as familiar or may not have the same opportunities or the same access uh, to enter into this type of work. Yeah. Um, so I was I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and and you know any other ideas that you might have uh, that could um, kind of help direct attention and energy into expanding the field. Absolutely, that is one of the core beliefs we have, right? So how do we stratify the profession? How do we make sure that uh, those who are again actively doing this work on the ground have the capacity and opportunity to be um, uh, to be uh, necessary components of the process of, of, of uh, the built environment, right? Uh, and so the couple things. So the, the first thing you mentioned, uh, I, I had the, the, the opportunity to, to lead a program called Project Pipeline for, um, for the last decade. And um, through that process, um, you know, we were really focused on serving uh, strategies around diversity in the in the 
the, the, the student population so that they would then be able to make their way to, to colleges with some uh, to colleges and university with some understanding of what the program might look like moving forward. And that was super successful. We had, you know, over 12,000 young people have been through that program uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And, um, but one of the things we realized is that uh, diversity, diversity is an outcome. Diversity and inclusion are outcomes. And this is for anybody in the audience who, who at the university level who makes any decisions. If your strategy is, is set and uh, specifically around just simply diversity, uh, you are going to fail. Uh, you have to center justice and equity uh, because diversity and inclusion is an outcome of justice and equity. It means that your programming shifts. If you want uh, people of, of diverse bodies to be in space, they have to feel uh, as though that space gives a damn about who they are as human beings. Uh, and so it is not simply enough to say uh, we want more black and brown faces in the room. Uh, it fundamentally means that we have to rebuild the table, rebuild the space to account for that. And so that's one of the things that we looked at uh, in relationship to to um, uh, DAP as, I'm sorry, uh, to Project Pipeline as a uh, program. Now, um, what we are more recently thinking about is uh, a program called uh, Community Design Advocates. And that really is a way for us to, um, to think about how, um, uh, how we can uh, introduce uh, those who have actively um, who have actively been doing this work over the last uh, 15, 20 years can be invested in the outputs of, society, of, of, of the built environment uh, through that work as they currently uh, are doing it. So, um, so yeah, so community design advocates are really a way for us to integrate those who are activists on the ground and who are advocates on the ground and making sure that they are, uh, again, invested in uh, that output. Um, we have another question from, question from the audience here, um, anonymous this time. Has your work dealt with uh, colonialism or addressed this as a foundation of systemic injustice? I'm going to venture that the answer is yes, but you're going to tell us how. Do you need me to read that again? Yeah, if you don't mind, sorry. Has your work dealt with colonialism or addressed this as a foundation of a systemic injustice? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, white supremacy and kind of colonial uh, 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 processes have always been at the root of, of what we are looking, what, what we are researching and understanding in order to do the work that we're doing, right? So if we don't understand the way that colonial system or colonialism as a system itself uh, works, um, then we are, then we are again destined to kind of reproduce produce, uh, those conditions. And so I think uh, I, I may have mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know, Fred Hampton talked about the fact that um, you can't reproduce, sorry, you the answer to capitalism is not black capitalism, it is it is socialism. The answer to colonialism is not a black colonialism or or what we consider the, the diverse colonial colonialism. It is actively a different system. And so we actually have to um, to to reconfigure our foundation foundational elements in order to uh, to move that forward. Um. Question from our uh, very own Lila uh, Kajalier, our director of events and programs. Um, how do we uh, operationalize connections to community on a larger scale? Um, how do we increase the understanding of planning, zoning, um, et cetera, in communities in general? Yeah. So I think the operationalizing of, of uh, uh, how we operationalize it is really uh, by again depowering uh, ourselves, <laughs> and that's tough, right? Providing and and building platforms with the power we do have, so that ultimately that power can then be redistributed. Um, uh, because as I mentioned, most uh, you know the PhDs on a block have a 
a much longer and thorough understanding of place and the nuances of place. Uh, and so we actually have to be vested and invested uh, in systems that support um, their growth and learning. Uh, and that means that we may have to, again, redistribute power and dollars um, into places where people exist, not to not into uh, uh, shepherding people from wherever they are into this this confined uh, community, right? And so if we're only ever trying to pull people from somewhere to uh, uh, to exist within this this kind of uh, isolated box that kind of again reproduces itself, then we are always going to get those same outputs, even if that's a diverse community, even if that's a series of people who have actively been doing that work because we're retraining them to, to, to think and do the things that we do, rather than providing the resources and power uh, uh, distribution to, uh, to understand and to amplify the things that they already do. Uh, I think Blights Out was the perfect example for us in that, you know, that was shepherded by uh, organizers and activists who were not designers, who were not architects, um, and, and really just wanted to understand what, you know, what gentrification was uh, in our cities. Um, so, so I think that's how we, we think about what the oper uh, operationalization of, of, of that work actually looks like. What was the second part of that question? Just to... I, I think you did answer that, but I, I, to make sure that I understand it, you're basically saying um, it's not about how to make zoning accessible or it's not about necessarily bringing community members uh, into a, a position or a level where they can navigate the zoning system. It's, it's about making the zoning system or other systems that we operate in that define our built environment, environment or redesigning those so that they are inherently yeah. accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, how have you navigated or addressed potential harms that you and your process might unintentionally cause to community members or collaborators? Yeah, so that's the, the kind of statement that architecture is never neutral. Um, no matter what we do, there is, there is harm uh, that is potentially there. Um, and harm, uh, in our case, is often, um, it's a great question. Harm is often a byproduct of um, who you talk to and how you talk to them and when you talk to them. It's really a it's a byproduct of of um, of a process that can only take in so much information uh, and requires you to um, uh, determine you know when when are the moments that you should be able to to be out in the world. The ways that we've tried to navigate some of that is that uh, you have to be as the as as a gatekeeper as somebody who holds any level of power within the system. We have to to a acknowledge when we when we mess up. That's a huge part of this. Is always just you know acknowledgement. Uh, the second is to repair in whatever way you can. And repair might look like uh, an active uh, reconciliation in which you you actually are back in communities talking with people uh, that you disagree with. So, for instance, I can give you one uh, example. Um, during the Claiborne process, we had a, a, a constituency that was really just uh, anti uh, this project, and they were community members, and they they uh, their voice was was heard throughout the process, and they would show up consistently to tell us about that. And we had to make sure that even in the most kind of heated situations, that between community members, uh, that we were able to allow for those who were against this entire project, they still had the space and opportunity uh, to voice uh, that dissent, right? The ability to dissent in public is, is absolutely valuable. And so building out the structures to make sure that that was a safe, uh, a continued safe uh, environment for those who dissent to the project to speak was a part of repair uh, because that wasn't always uh, the way that it operated, right? Like it, it wasn't always the, the, the opportunity there. And so uh, the other way that we try to, um, to get out in front of it is that for nearly every project we do, I mean, this is not everyone, but uh, the ones that we, 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 we do through co-locate, we try to have um, some version of a uh, public facing um, 
or, or newspapers. So we send, so for instance, for a project we're doing uh, out west now in Portland, uh, we sent out 19,000 newspapers to, um, to uh, the broader community, specifically in the neighborhoods uh, that, were, uh, that would potentially be using this uh, project. So 19,000 newspapers that talked about the, who we talked to, when we talked to them, gave people more opportunities to have conversations moving forward and to lay out what, what decisions had been made already and what decisions will be made moving forward. And so there's a way in which, uh, again, providing space and platform for those who we have harmed to dissent publicly and to be able to acknowledge and repair where you can, and then ultimately uh, changing your process to make sure that that information is more globally accessible, even, uh, even when it might slow the process down uh, longer term. 19,000 is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> But we, I mean, like it was 20, 20, 20, 20, 000 for, for paper monuments. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's around that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, question from Lori Brown. Um, she says, thank you so much for discussing your engagement. Uh, this work is clearly rooted in an intimate knowledge in the community you engage and collaborate with. Do you hope to bring this model to other communities outside of Louisiana? And if so, how will you go about this? For example, is it to find other organizations to collaborate with in other parts of the country, uh, mentor and train others to do this work? Yeah, so we run Design Justice Trainings. A, um, we do partner with people in, in other communities already. Um, so we've worked in Toronto, we've worked in DC, we've worked in uh, uh, Portland and Seattle and and across the country. And so um, the way that we usually operate is that we, uh, we attempt to find uh, other either design firms that practice in similar ways. We attempt to work with organizers, like actual organizers on the ground um, who understand and build out this work in very specific ways. Um, a, because they've had established relationships, they understand the, the, the pain points uh, in a community. And then ultimately uh, our, our, able to um, uh, simplify the process of getting in front of and talking to and building relationships with um, a community that we're attempting to work with for uh, an extended period of time. So we're going to take two more questions. Yeah. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, there is talk now about moving towards a practice of maintenance and care slash repair. What does that look like or mean for designers and architects? What does it mean for cities and communities? Yeah, it's, it means that we have to slow down. It means that we have to acknowledge, and again, some of this is not, um, we, are, we are a part of a process, um, but it means ultimately that um, maintenance means that we have to respect and honor uh, the stories and the places and spaces that exist uh, in a community already, the culture that exists in a community already. Um, and when we do that, we can start to, um, we can really start to lift um, the, the buried assets of, of, of place, right? Um, and ultimately, like I said, it means we have to slow down so much so that we can actually hear those stories, so that we can actually respond to them through a design that, that reflects, and for us to be comfortable being wrong, right? I mean, essentially, we're asking people to, we're going into a community and asking them to, to learn a new language um, uh, every time a, a new space is going, going up. And, and to, to do that, and then to be able to speak fluently about how, uh, to articulate how uh, this, this language is either doing harm or, or is not really communicating appropriately. And so in order to do that, we have to really humble ourselves uh, and, and be willing to challenge our clients uh, and officials. We have to be able to say, you're effing up, client. You need to slow down. You need to change your process. Because um, in, in large part, uh, the decisions that that have to be made are are usually on their on their backs, and so we have to to um, to acknowledge what roles we can play within that process. Maintenance and care. <laughs> Good question. Um, last question for this evening. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce the name. Uh, Orechi Ugugua is asking, 
how do we as design students truly decolonize our architecture curriculum within an institution with heavily colonial industrial um, colonial history and system? Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough. It's someone, <laughs> uh, someone who you know fought that good fight uh, for a while. What you realize is that you're in school for a very short amount of time. So two things I would say is you you really have to find the advocates on the staff that are willing to um, willing to push um, a kind of uh, uh, anti-colonial uh, pedagogy through uh, through this work or anti-racist pedagogy through uh, through this work and and then create the moments and the opportunities uh, in small part building up to, to uh, larger coursework uh, over time so we, we, we were able to, to bring certain uh, lectures in uh, when when I was in school and that turned into larger coursework or tied into uh, the the NOMAS competition, which allowed for us to to reflect on some of these ideas at a broader uh, level, and then ultimately uh, expand your education, expand the spaces and places by which you get uh, education from, uh, because ultimately this is one small part of your existence, and you will uh, definitely need to um, to be able to. Uh, take away from what you learn in school the 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 mechanics of, of architecture and design and planning uh, but you will also need the things that are, are left behind in design school which is the kind of uh social cultural uh training that's necessary moving forward and so i'd say expand your your footprint of where you learn from go to other lectures uh go to the library go to other schools uh within your university and and start to 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 bring that learning back into your work. Thank you, Brian. I think thank that you. is an excellent note to end on. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do appreciate it. I also want to thank our uh, Dean and um, Lila Cajalia, our, our fantastic uh, events coordinator, um, director, excuse me. Uh, I have many more questions. I think we're going to have to do yeah. that another time we'll, we'll, we'll get back on it i will say one thing right uh and I, I i take this with me nearly every day um i i remember we were talking lee a, a few years back or maybe a year or so back and i was saying you know uh, an architect's job is really to that one of our jobs is to kind of uh navigate and, and move the water that's coming into a place and get it away from a building and you were like yeah, the water is supposed to be there, right? And you so like there's this thing about respecting uh, patterns, routines, and like where uh, the indigenous uh, spaces and places. And I and I I may have uh, translated a little bit as a metaphor, but like thinking about the indigeneity of of people and place and where things uh, have have uh, are, are how they're supposed to exist within a particular environment, and how much we as as designers often uh, harm and change that and so i appreciate you so much for for being a part of this community and and for uh doing this with me today i appreciate you thank you yeah. brian lee everyone yeah thank yeah. you <laughs> appreciate it have a good night yes you too thanks everybody <laughs>